All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today, I'm delighted to be joined from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, by Kira Wisman. How are you doing, Kira? I am doing well. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. And uh, Kira is a dynamic, dedicated, operational and finance leader offering 20 years plus experience in both the private and public sectors with a leadership style that's collaborative and compassionate. She brings an array of excellent technical skills with a practical application. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is actually motivating employees and getting solid engagement and loyalty across a range of ages and experienced leaders. So how to become an engage out of this, how to become an engaged leader without becoming a buddy. Yes, yeah. that uh, is a fine line sometimes. It is. Uh, I think we could probably do a session on parenting too, how to be a proper parent and not be a buddy <laughs> either. <laughs> <laughs> goes hand in hand. <laughs> it does absolutely. All right. Well, let's 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 get into it, uh, um, Kira. One of the one of the issues that's facing people because uh, somebody said I think we have five generations in the workforce right now. I mean, the most we've ever ever had in the workforce, right? And you know, potentially, probably the most diverse if you take it from the boomer end to the other end. You know very, very different groups of people. And so it's becoming more of more of a, of a challenge for organizations and leaders is how do I engage across generations with different needs and different approaches? And so and it's becoming, I think, quite, it's becoming quite difficult for people, really. It is, you know, and rightfully so. You know, you just think about Anytime even just dealing with your family across generations, you know, people that love and know one another for years at a time. And it um, is difficult to identify, you know, a much older person to identify with a younger person. And there's not not a lot of common ground there in, in the workplace. You're dealing with uh, people who don't know each other quite as well. People have a wide variety of skill sets, wide variety of views on the world, where it is today, where it might be heading. Uh, so, you know, and you're right. We have a lot of older people still staying in the workforce longer for whatever reason that might be. And a lot of young people who are entering the workforce that don't have the same set of social skills and, uh, and, and really aren't necessarily as prepared to go out in the world today based on the education and schooling they have had, just a different environment, um, to, to be able to deal with those older people. It is a challenge I have seen in every one of my positions that has involved a leadership role something that there isn't a one size fits all mm -hmm. uh, approach to fix uh you you really you know i'm in the accounting world so you know we're we're real technical we're we're usually worried about debits and credits and numbers mm -hmm. and a lot of times it doesn't come with a a solid set of um human skills sure. you, know, you, you want to get the numbers right and, and and having to deal with different personalities and different people's situations is sometimes hard to to reconcile and in, in work into the day but it's critical to success uh it, it really is and it can be done mm -hmm. uh, it, it just takes uh patience and compassion and flexibility <laughs> yeah so let's talk a little bit about that because no I, t I totally agree with you about the 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 flexibility and compassion. And I think the first thing is is probably to admit to yourself that, yeah, maybe I need to learn how to communicate a little bit differently with some of these people. Maybe I'm pretty good at communicating with people from my own generation or even the generation below, or even the generation ahead of it. But I need to work on those other generations, the ones that I probably feel most disconnected from. Uh, sure. You know, you have the the boomers and they're still in the workforce and then you have the gen z's who are just entering the workforce those are two vastly different sets of people nothing wrong with either one of them i mean both have their strengths and weaknesses but you know the boomers grew up with a certain set of working conditions and a sort of a sort of a set of working expectations what was expected of them in the workplace you know you got up every day it was more of a grind you, you know you, you prepared for work you drove to work you sat in an office you know, it was a much more structured and probably firm, um, not as friendly atmosphere. And you have Gen Z who is rolling out of, you, you know, childhood and upper education and coming into the workforce that is a much, they have a much more relaxed attitude about work. 
they have a much more flexible attitude about work. It's no longer that nine to five mentality with that one hour break for lunch in between. You know, they fully believe, and in most cases, they're right, that the workday can be flexible. You know, when, when I am bright and fresh might not be when you are bright and fresh. So when you have those two different sets of people clashing and, you know, we are all, we're all the same. The older people always think they know more than the younger people. And the younger people always think they know everything. I know <laughs> I, I thought my parents were stupid. I mean, and that now that I'm older, I'm like, they were right about everything. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, it, it, as, as a manager, no matter where you are in any of those age groups, you have to you need know, to be able to step back, listen to both sides, not necessarily about the technical aspects of the mm-hmm. job, because those are pretty standardized yeah. in most cases and say, you know, what do you want out of your day? And, you know, what do you want out of your day? And let's talk about this and find some common ground and right. be polite and respectful, which is something that I think has gone to the wayside a lot with the advent of social media and being able to communicate across screens that that human interaction kind of gets lost. And that's where that compassion kind of starts to disappear. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And um, as I, I always say to my 18 year old son, I'm sorry, I'm too old to know everything. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I feel that way sometimes. It's like I'm not enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but come, back to your, come back to your point. I think it's a it's a really important one because, um, yeah, there is a huge change now in terms of, as you said, is working styles, working time, working setup. And I think that that's a great opportunity for organizations because if you can be flexible to meet those needs of those younger people coming in, then, then you can, you know, there's a contract there, right? Then they have to give you some commitments or whatever. They have to be flexible in return. So just having that conversation, if your work, if your, if your job or the role allows you to work more flexibly, I think making that available, but in return for that, you know, accountability, Accountability, you know, that is something that is difficult to foster in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the education scene has changed somewhat. And, you know, there's that mentality of kind of everybody gets a ribbon. And Mm -hmm. I do not have children, so I don't have firsthand experience with this. But from what I understand, that even test taking has become different. You, Mm -hmm. You might have multiple times to take a test to get a better score. Whereas in the workplace, you're not going to be faced with that. So that younger generation comes in and says, wait a minute, you know, I've, I've grown up and been taught my entire life that you know, I'm going to have unlimited chances and that I'm, you know, able to kind of do things the way that I want to get them done. And why all of a sudden are you telling me I can't do this? I'm just going to leave, you know, and obviously we don't want that. So that's when you have to find a compassionate way You have to see things how they are. I mean, it really is just, hey, if I was in their shoes and this is what I was told and taught for years and years. And, you know, they they have a point to some extent. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything needs to be as rigid as it has been over the past years. Let's try to say, you know, okay, well, I see where you're coming from, but we really do need to get these things done. And this is why, you know, that, that explaining and saying, you know, we don't need to maybe be as you work till 10 p.m. like Mm -hmm. we did 50 years ago. But, you you know, maybe we need you to work till 6 p.m. And if that means, you know, we need to give you some time somewhere else, that's where the flexibility comes in. You know, we'll make arrangements for that. But this deadline is important. So it it just really comes down to as a leader, bridging that gap. And 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 it's uh, the the, this is where the buddy situation becomes that that fine line is a problem because you have to be able to identify with who you're working with without becoming a friend. And it it, it can be done because Mm -hmm. as long as you are somebody that stays true to your word, you get, you know, you go to, you you get up every day and you come in and you have a genuine passion for what you do and the people who work for you and you believe in them, they're going to feel that and respect you enough that you can get to know them on a professional level you know, you're going to care about who they are as a person, but without, you know, fostering what would be called, you know, a friendship that where where somebody feels like they could probably take advantage of somebody in a management or leadership role. Yeah. And I think a key to that is being authentic though. I mean, you can be compassionate and you can figure out how to accommodate them, but not adopt a a fake persona. And I think, unfortunately, I think some people are doing that now because they're going to the extreme, like leaders, you know, suddenly trying to be so on this end just to try and relate to people. 
people i think people relate to you if you are genuine and honest and authentic it doesn't mean they have to like everything you do they don't have to, to be honest they don't even have to like you uh, right. as long as as long as you're authentic you're you're consistent uh, and relatively predictable and fair i think then you can you can develop a, a rapport with anybody Yes, yes. You know, I, I work with a team of people who have vastly different backgrounds, you mm -hmm. know, even vastly different cultural backgrounds. Right. And, uh, you know, that authenticism and, and being being humble and being able to admit when you've made a mistake and being able to prop up your team members. You know, I, you know, I try to give kudos when somebody does something well as much as I possibly right. can. I make sure that my team gets credit for something before I ever would get credit for it. Uh, you know, and, and that, again, that, that gives them the motivation and the respect and the desire to want to work for you and to work with each other. Because when they see their leader patting, you know, the other team members on the back, it, it really had I me. Mean, I brought a really difficult group of people together who had nothing in common. And now they, you know, they joke around with each other a little bit. They're learning a little bit about each other's cultures. They're patting each other on the back and that, that team communication. And we're in a virtual environment where mm -hmm. I work now. So it's often hard to foster a sense of team in that sort of situation, but that, that authentic openness and, and just willing to meet somebody where they're at and you, uh, breathe success for everybody mm -hmm. in the organization. Yeah, and and you just uh, you and uh, just uh, touched upon an important point right there is uh, we're really good by human human nature is such a funny thing but we're great at spotting things that aren't working or mistakes or whatever we're great at that right when we see something working or somebody doing something good we just kind of go Ooh, and then move on because that's not an issue instead of catching people doing something right is what yeah. we should be doing um, because we're fantastic about catching people doing something wrong. Um, but when you can't, when you comment on somebody doing something right or well, and they weren't expecting that feedback, I mean, those, those things really make a difference. It makes a huge difference. You, you know, if you just think about how, how you feel when somebody compliments you and what that makes you, you know, want to go that extra mile or whatever that might be, you know, so why wouldn't you want to do that for somebody else? You know, especially in the accounting industry, it's all about finding mm -hmm. mistakes and it's, you know, it's a very high stress environment. Sure. And, and, and historically, it really has been about, oh, geez, OK, here's a set of financial statements and you did these five things wrong and I need you to go back and fix them and resubmit this to me. And that's kind of the age old model and our industry is suffering for it. So, uh, you know, instead of looking for what's wrong, I look for what's right. And if I find something that's wrong and inevitably you're going to find things are sure. done, done incorrectly, I don't just say, hey, you did this wrong figure it out and get back to me. It's more of a, hey, this isn't quite what we want to see. It's all, again, all in the communication and how you frame something. Let's talk about it together. Or why don't you take another look at this? And if you know if you can't figure it out quickly, ask and we'll walk through it together. There's, there's just a, you get a yeah. much better response than, you know, hey, you really messed this up. Goodness gracious. You know, do you ever do anything right? That's yeah. not going to get a good response out of anybody in, in, <laughs> in the world. And, um, and in the professional services world, I think all too often it really it, you, that positive reinforcement is overlooked. And I completely yeah. flip that around. I would rather give 10 compliments for every one thing I find that is incorrect than the other way around. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's it, it, it's funny. And it's, it's just funny. The, the whole the whole psychology, the whole psychology of it uh, is funny today. And, and especially that with just uh, with with and with human nature too, but I think, I think it's so, it is so incredibly important, but what you just outlined there though, was a classic coaching model. And here's something else that people don't understand is people aren't taught how to be coaches. Right. And when somebody says, Oh, you need to coach your people, they go, okay, let me think. Hmm. Last coach I worked under, Oh, high school volleyball coach right. or high school. And so basically I just tell you what to do, tell you what to do, tell you again, what to do, and then you do it. Uh, yes. And that's what and that's what coaching is. And that's so not coaching. It isn't. You know, I, I originally had an accounting degree still and have worked in the accounting industry my entire career. But I went back to school and got a psychology degree many mm. years ago at this point uh, because the, the social aspect of the workforce and social psychology in general fascinated me. And as I became a manager and moved up through the ranks, I have never had in my professional capacity 
managerial training that would give mm -hmm. me any sort of people skills and uh -huh. anything I have. And it's a shame. And yeah. I, I, I think a lot of people flounder around and don't know how. So because I was interested in it, I kind of found my own way. And if, you know, trial and error, you know, what works with something, what doesn't work with something over the years. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but that, that coaching aspect is key and it isn't, you know, we don't want to be in a football locker room screaming, why in the world did you fumble that football? <laughs> you, you know, and, and you're going to go do 50 push-ups. That certainly is going to make most people walk right out of the room. So exactly. I'm not a positively coach. I am seeing now in my current role, I haven't been in very long, that there, there is a lot of, of more touchy feely type education becoming available to managers in our industry and i think the realization is is that since nobody wants to be in the industry we're going to have to change how we how we deal with people and be effective and kind and and, and use a, an actual coaching model it's almost like a life coaching model yeah but yeah, yeah that, that that skill is not easy to obtain uh, and, and if it's not something that comes natural to you and you're not a people person it's going to be you have to work that much harder to develop that skill set uh, no, hundred percent, and uh, and I think one of the biggest uh, mistakes I think that it was ever made was calling those skills soft skills, and wow. I think that's the worst because a lot of people you go oh I'll, I'll pay for the hard skills because they're needed right the technical skills the hard skills they're all needed and then the soft skills man, this all sounds a bit wishy washy to me so we tend to push that aside so I always think the mistake was calling them soft skills and differentiating between the two because I think hard skills soft skills you need both yin yang. What can I yeah, say? You know, yeah, equally. I mean, if anything, those soft skills are more important mm -hmm. because uh, because you the, the people are what make your business. The people are right. who your company is, and that's who's going to rep your company and talk about your company. So if if you don't have uh, people working effectively and everybody rowing in the same direction and all the butts in the right seats, so to mm -hmm. speak. You know, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. You could you could teach everybody how to to make widgets or put together a set of financial statements or whatever the skill might be, but you're, you, you're not going to get that uh, real good collaboration mm -hmm. and, and that extra effort and result if you can't deal effectively with people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that you touched on there is, I mean, a lot of businesses are remote now or hybrid. So you're building teams that maybe you, know, you don't see face to face anymore, like in a physical setting or, or rarely or whatever. And that takes, as you said, when you're building rapport among a remote team, that takes a little bit additional work on your behalf. But it's also very tempting, though, because everything is remote. It's very tempting to cancel a meeting or cancel something because nobody's standing outside your door, right? So it's right. very easy. And if you start to play like that or you don't, you know, you keep pushing meetings off or whatever, you're sending out messages to your people about their importance. Absolutely. You know, it is... And you have to come to every meeting, every virtual meeting, more uh, more composed and more uh, with, with more energy than you might have to come to a meeting when you're walking into a conference room because mm -hmm. they, they your your voice, your tone, your face it is everything in a virtual environment. Yep. Whereas in person, you know, there's a little bit of body language. You might say, "Oh, you know, Jan is tired." You know, you can see that Jan is tired today. You can't tell those things, or Jan had a bad day yesterday, and you, you don't know as that as much about that person when you see them in person as you mm -hmm. do in a remote environment. So yes, you you kind of have to bring it, and at every remote engagement and it took me some time you know mm -hmm. I, I kind of this was my first fully remote role and i'm thinking geez these people i talk and i ask questions and everybody just blinks back at me i was like why is nobody engaging with me and you know it, and it really took me kind of you know talking with everybody one-on-one -on -one and you know learning a little bit about them and then using those things that i have learned at, to you know say hey you know i heard you you had a fun weekend last weekend you, you know you want to you know, tell the group about it. You know, we do care about who you are, yeah. even though we're all just, you know, faces on the screen. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's a, an absolutely perfect point because, uh, like you say, you have to put the effort, you have to put the effort into and you have to do the reaching out. And yes, and you can't expect some people will be very comfortable with the virtual meeting. Some people won't. Um, and some people are. The other thing I think is which kind of nice about virtual uh, I've seen over the years is sometimes you see those people who would have gotten lost in a physical meeting, who would have quietly actually start to find their voice. And sometimes the, the people who are great in a physical setting, all gregarious, suddenly become a little more self 
self-conscious on a on a remote thing. So you get sometimes you get a little bit of little bit of better balance coming in if you manage it. It's fascinating. I, it, you're you are so right. You know, people really come to you know the shy people in an in-person meeting feel a lot more comfortable. And you know it is a different world. You're in a virtual meeting and you can see yourself, and in a yep. in-person meeting you generally cannot see yourself. So it, it's hard to overcome that hurdle of, oh, geez, you know, my hair sticking straight up in the air and, uh, you know, oh, I have a face looks all washed out, you know, especially as a woman these days. You know, I think the, the, the Botox industry went through the roof oh, yeah. when the virtual world hit because everybody was staring at themselves a lot. But uh, yeah, you do. The, the personalities change. And um, when you do get together in person, which my company tries very hard to do a couple times a year is to to bring all the remote people together. Um, it, it, it was it was interesting to sit back and watch who was maybe very outgoing online mm -hmm. and who was very shy and was not as engaging in person. And um, as leaders, it, it's our job to pull that out and try to you know to get a, get a cohesive group together. And you know, by the end of the two days, everybody was laughing, joking, mm -hmm. talking, and it and it you know it went a long way. And again. It's those soft skills you're talking about that are, were the most important part of that in-person meeting. It yeah. wasn't the accounting topics. It wasn't the marketing topics. It was the getting to know each other as a person and the teams who work with each other who had never seen, you know, except from here up, you know, mm -hmm. shoulder up uh, to get to know one another on, on a different level. And, you, you know, you could either be very successful at that or you could let everybody sit in the corner and kind of, you melt away and you just you really don't want that it's not it's not good yeah. for anybody no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, Kira, this has been fantastic. All of Kira's information will be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Sure. Um, I work in the public accounting industry. I work for a firm out of Alexandria, Virginia called KWC CPAs, and I am in their client advisory services department, outsourced accounting, um, outsourced controller and CFO work, uh, specialize in operations and people, and uh, really enjoy that aspect of the job. Um, I've been all over. I've been in private industry, I've been in public accounting, uh, a couple of different uh, college degrees. And if anybody is interested in reaching out, you can get my information below or you can find me on my LinkedIn page under my name. Perfect. Again, thank you, Kira. And thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.